gates will please take their seats. Ladies and gentlemen of the convention, I believe with the wishes of a vast majority of the Republicans in every state in the Union, I come to pray before you to face in nomination for the office of Vice President of the United States. Mr. Chairman, delegates, alternate delegates, and fellow Americans, as I rise to nominate the next Vice President of the United States, we want a man. We want no Superman, no Miracle Man. This calls for a man. The campaign of 1840 marked the first bandwagon type of convention in American history and produced the first vice president to reach the White House by accident of death. Since then, the United States has been governed 21% of the time by men never elected as president. In the 20th century, almost one out of every three presidents has died in office and two have been seriously ill. Many of the founding fathers fought against creating the vice presidency in the first place. And since then, party bosses have regarded it as a political graveyard, as a device to appease a special section of the electorate. We, as a nation, spend the best part of a year selecting our president. Conventions have cast as many as 103 ballots before nominating a presidential candidate. Most vice presidential candidates have been nominated on one ballot, often in a matter of minutes, in a half-empty hall. The system has produced some worthy vice president, but at best, it's a compromise, and at worst, it's a game of roulette with the nation's destiny. One vice president served while under indictment for murder. Another took bribe. Another was drunk at his inauguration. One 20th century vice president had never been to Washington until elected. After the conventions of 1952, the Gallup poll reported that not one voter out of four knew the names of both candidates for the vice presidency. Richard Nixon of California, Republican. John Sparkman of Alabama, Democrat. Tonight, See It Now presents a study of the vice rights and duties and history Edited and produced by Edward R. Morrow and Fred W. Friendly. In the next 60 minutes, you will see former Vice Presidents Harry Truman, Alvin Barkley, and Henry Wallace testify on the office. A film of President Eisenhower telling a press conference how his running mate was selected. A reenactment from the life of President John Tyler that changed the concept of the office. Carl Sandburg on the nomination of Andrew Johnson. Victor Moore as Vice President Bottom in a classic scene from A V.I.C., a visit to Independence Hall, where the Vice Presidency was created, and the first campaign song in American history. Tonight's report begins in Philadelphia where the vice presidency began. Good evening. Fathers wrote the Constitution of the United States. Here they created the presidency, the vice presidency, the legislative and judicial branches of the government, a system which has given us greater prosperity and more freedom than has ever before existed in the world. Here in this room, the founding fathers, 55 of them, hammered out the Constitution of the United States. The presiding officer sitting on that dais was George Washington. He was chosen unanimously for the task, and his views and his prestige contributed much to the discussion of the presidency and its duties. They knew the president was to be an important man, but they didn't know just how important. In those days, mainly he was important to Americans, only about four million of them. Today, he is of paramount importance to about 160 million Americans, in addition to which he is the leader of the coalition of the free nations, something the founding fathers never conceived of. The president is now as far from the hydrogen bomb as the telephone on his night table. And if the presidency is of such great importance, 
the vice presidency must also be, because the two offices are separated one from the other by merely a heartbeat. We don't know exactly where the various delegates sat during this convention, but James Madison must perhaps have been sitting just here. In any event, he had to sit up close in order that he could hear, because his diaries represent most of what we know about what went on during that 16-week convention. There was no press gallery, no reporters. They met behind closed doors. Actually, the presidency caused more argument at the convention than anything else. At first, the founding fathers couldn't decide whether they wanted an individual or whether they wanted a council or a committee of some kind. The convention finally decided on a single person and then proceeded to wrangle over the way to elect him. Twice, they voted against his being elected by the people. It seemed to be just about settled that he would be elected by the Congress, and that perhaps is why no mention was made of the vice presidency until much later in the convention. The proposal for the president to be elected by Congress would have meant, of course, that in case of his death, the Congress could have elected a new president. Well, eventually, in order to wind things up, they referred outstanding matters to a subcommittee, that is, a committee of 11, one from each state. They met over a long weekend and came up with a surprise. They threw out the election by Congress, they proposed the Electoral College, and they proposed the Vice Presidency. Probably Alexander Hamilton was the father of the Vice Presidency. The convention debated it for one day. There was very considerable opposition. One on the grounds that it was a needless office, and the other, there was very much concern about the proposal that the vice president should preside over the Senate and vote in case of a tie. This was regarded as a dangerous merging of the executive and legislative functions of the government. Ben Franklin is reported to have said, I am against having a vice president. He didn't say it in this room or at that convention, but he went on to say, if they insist upon having one, I shall address him as your superfluous excellency. John Adams, when he became the first vice president, did write to his wife, my country has in its wisdom contrived for me the most insignificant office that ever the invention of man contrived or his imagination conceived. One thing is clear. The founding fathers intended that the vice president, after the president, should be the man next best qualified to be president. They provided that the man receiving the second largest number of votes should become vice president. The exact language is provided in the Constitution in case of the removal of the president from office, or of his death, resignation, or inability to discharge the powers and duties of said office, the same shall devolve on the vice president until the disability be removed or a president shall be elected. The exact meaning of the founding fathers in these sentences was to become the subject of a bitter controversy over the vice presidency. Was it the powers and duties or the office that was to devolve upon the vice president. But the system broke down when the two-party system appeared. This, the founding fathers had not planned on. At this point, the Constitution was amended. The 12th Amendment, adopted in 1804, called on the Electoral College to vote separately for the vice president. This was a far-reaching change. No longer did the second best qualified man become vice president, but a second string party man was nominated and elected. This is the Capitol in Washington. The cornerstone was laid by President Washington in 1793. And when Thomas Jefferson was inaugurated in 1800, the building looked like this. The present massive Capitol has been built around it. This report on the vice presidency continues with Eric Severide of the Capitol. The Senate originally met in a room in the basement and the House met here. And this plaque commemorates the first crisis in the election of a president and a vice president. Ironically, Thomas Jefferson and Aaron Burr, who were supposed to end up as president and vice president, ended up tied for the presidency. And the House of Representatives cast 36 successive ballots in a bitter struggle before Jefferson could win a majority. In the present Senate chamber, 300 feet north of here, Vice President Aaron Burr's bust is preserved right next to that of his bitter foe, Jefferson. Burr later shot Alexander Hamilton, the man who had conceived the office of Vice President.
It was this Jefferson Burr mix-up that caused Congress to write the 12th Amendment, changing the electoral system. And it was then that the prestige of the office really went into decline. For most of the next 60 years, the Senate met in this chamber across the hall, which in 1860 became the home of the Supreme Court. The first vice president to serve in this room under the new system was George Clinton. Once an illustrious governor of New York, he was given the vice presidency. Now quite deaf and almost blind, he served out a second term and died in the crisis preceding the War of 1812. By 1825, the Capitol had been considerably enlarged, and there was a small wooden dome. John C. Calhoun was the first vice president since Jefferson to meet the original standards set by the founding fathers. But Calhoun, a man who knew what was important, was the only vice president ever to resign. He left the dais of the Senate under the eagle to accept the senatorial vacancy from his home state of South Carolina. In 1832, Andrew Jackson was elected for his second term as president, and Martin Van Buren was his running mate. Van Buren was the only vice president who ever presided with a brace of pistols beside him. Four years later, he achieved another distinction. He was the only vice president since the 12th Amendment to be elected president without first having succeeded on the death of a president, and that record still stands. Van Buren's vice president, Richard M. Johnson, is credited with having personally killed the great Indian chief Tecumseh at the Battle of the Thames. He is credited with little else. Now it is 1840. Webster, Calhoun, Clay, all sit in this chamber, all aspire to the presidency. For the first 51 years of the new republic, no president has died in office. Then the rollicking, boisterous campaign of 1840. And for the first time in American history, death was to test the vice presidency. In 1840, the Whigs passed over the obvious choices of Henry Clay and Daniel Webster and nominated General William Henry Harrison and John Tyler, an anti-Jackson rat, to run against the incumbent, Van Buren. Tippecanoe and Tyler, too became the first campaign song in political history. Let them talk about hard cider and log cabins too. It will only speed the ball for Tippecanoe and Tyler too. For Tippecanoe and Tyler too. And Harrison got the nickname Tippecanoe from the battle at Tippecanoe. When the Democrats accused him of being a heavy drinker who would spend his term drinking hard cider in front of a log cabin, the Whigs turned it into their slogan. Hard Cider and Log Cabin. The Whig Party boss, Nicholas Biddle, told Candidate Harrison to say nothing at all to anybody and let no committee or town meeting extract from him a single word about what he thought or what he would do as president. It worked. Tippecanoe and Tyler, too, won handily over Van Buren. At 69, Harrison was sworn in. He caught cold at his inaugural and one month later was on his way back to Ohio for burial. John Tyler was in Williamsburg when the news came. He managed to borrow money for the trip and headed back to Washington. Tyler's temporary headquarters was at the lavish Brown's Indian Hotel on Pennsylvania Avenue. Here on April 6, 1841, John Tyler met the cabinet for the first time. One Democrat was sitting down with five Whigs dominated by Secretary of State Daniel Webster. This was an artist's conception of the meeting. Now here is a brief dramatic impression of what the record says happened as the entire concept of the vice presidency endured its first test. My first act when arriving in Washington was to call on Chief Justice Tawney. He's visiting in Baltimore and will not return for several days. Judge Cranch was prepared to administer the oath of office for me immediately after this meeting. Uh, Mr. Vice President, I suppose you intend to carry on the ideas and customs of your predecessor. And the administration inaugurated by President Harrison will continue in the same line of policy under which it has begun. Custom, Mr. Webster? It was our custom in the cabinet of the late president to act as a body with majority rule. 
The president presided over us, and the custom and proceeding was that any measures whatsoever relating to the administration were brought before the cabinet and decided by a majority vote, each member and the president having one vote. I am very glad to have in my cabinet such able statesmen as you have proved yourselves to be, and I shall be pleased to avail myself of your counsel and advice. But Mr. Webster, I can never consent to being dictated to as to what I shall and shall not do. I, as president, will be responsible for my administration. The final decision will be mine, as president. I hope to have your cooperation in carrying out its measure. So long as you see fit to do this, I shall be glad to have you with me. When you think otherwise, your resignation will be accepted. But Mr. Vice President, there is considerable legal I opinion. I am the President. Mr. Tyler, there is considerable legal opinion that in the death of the President, the Vice President will act as President. And John Quincy Adams only yesterday made reference to you as acting president. Mr. Granger, it Mr. is Mr. Tyler, on Sunday, the cabinet reached the conclusion that you would, while performing the functions of the president, bear the title of vice president or acting president. It is my conviction that the Constitution intends that the vice president shall become the president with all of his rights and duties. According to the Constitution, the moment William Henry Harrison died, I became the president. Every vice president for the next 115 years can thank Tyler for his interpretation of the Constitution. Later, John Quincy Adams, a former president and son of a president and vice president, took the side of the cabinet, writing in his diary of April 16th, I paid a visit this morning to Mr. Tyler, who styles himself president of the United States and not vice president, which would be the correct style. It is a construction in direct violation both of the grammar and context of the Constitution, which confers upon the vice president not the office, but the powers and duties of said office. Tyler served as president for three years and 11 months, one of the stormiest administrations in history. Eventually, the entire cabinet resigned. All told, Tyler ran through five secretaries of war, three attorneys general, four secretaries of the treasury, four secretaries of state, two postmasters general, and five secretaries of the Navy. Later, there was a resolution in the House attempting to impeach Tyler, calling him acting president only. But it was unsuccessful. Oh, Tippy Canoe and Tyler too, they satisfy me and they please you. And with them will be civil band, 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 with them will be civil band. Five years after Tyler left the presidency, a second vice president was summoned to the highest office in the land by death. Another Whig general, Zachary Taylor, hero of the Mexican War, had won the election of 48. On July 4, 1850, he attended a celebration at the building site of the Washington Monument. Four hours of senatorial speeches in the hot summer sun were too much for him. He went back to the White House and cooled off with two quarts of iced milk and ripe cherries. Five days later, President Taylor was dead of cholera morbus. He was succeeded by Vice President Millard Fillmore, another New Yorker, a pliable politician who ran a caretaker government until 1853, when he won neither re-election nor even nomination. For the next four years, the nation was again without a vice president. In 52, William King, age 67, won the vice presidency on the Democratic ticket with Franklin Pierce. Too old and too sick to come to Washington for the inauguration, King was allowed to take the oath in Cuba and died a month later without ever presiding as vice president in the chamber where his statue now stands. Next came John Breckinridge of Kentucky, the youngest vice president in history, 35 when elected, and one of the best presiding officers the Senate ever had. He was runner-up to Lincoln in the fateful election of 1860, they were putting the great iron dome on the Capitol now. Lincoln's first vice president was Hannibal Hamlin, a senator from Maine, whom Lincoln had never met prior to nomination. <laughs> 
Four years later, Hamlin was dumped from the ticket for political expediency, and Andrew Johnson of Tennessee was the new running mate. Inebriated at his own inauguration, his friend said he was getting over a bad case of typhoid, Johnson served 41 days as vice president, and then, by the act of John Wilkes Booth, became president. This is the tailor shop in Greenville, Tennessee, from which Andrew Johnson came. And here is historian Carl Sandberg to tell how it was that Johnson became vice president in the first place. Greenville, Tennessee. And this is the tailor shop of Andrew Johnson, who became the 17th president of the United States. This was his tailor shop. Over 110 years ago, he sat on this table here, sat cross-legged with his threads and needles. This is the shears he used, the identical shears that Andrew Johnson used. Somehow or other, he learned to read by himself without going to school. And he learned from his 17-year-old wife. There came, June the 7th, 1864, the convention of the National Union Party in Baltimore. And they nominated a ticket. Lincoln for president, Andrew Johnson for vice president. And why did they nominate Andrew Johnson for vice president? What were the facts and figures and considerations that led up to the nomination? First of all, he came from a southern slave state and was a Democrat. From the very beginning of the war, the Lincoln administration had been afraid of the possibility of European intervention. At some, some turn of the war, the Union armies, uh, if it looked as though they were going to lose the war, as though the war might go on forever and never end, it might be that there would be recognition by Britain or by France. But if it could be that in the November elections of 64, the news could be sent to Europe that the vice president of the United States came from a southern slave state, they could point to Andrew Johnson. And that was what happened. On March 4th, there was the inauguration. Lincoln sworn in for his second term as president and Andrew Johnson sworn in as vice president. 41 days after those inaugurations, Abraham Lincoln lay dead on a cot in the Peterson house opposite the Ford Theater. And Andrew Johnson was sworn in as the 17th president of the United States. What is to be derived from this whole affair of Andrew Johnson? Who would have been the second best man by way of ability? No one knows. The convention would have had difficulties solving that, but the convention didn't care particularly about the second best man in ability. They went after the man who had politically and geographically qualifications that they wanted. In 1868, the Republicans tried to impeach Andrew Johnson. This is a ticket of admission given out by the Senate for the proceedings, proceedings which resembled a circus. Actually, Johnson was impeached by the House, but failed of expulsion by the Senate by a single vote. Generally, history has been kinder to Johnson, but as Carl Sandburg said, he was never regarded or nominated as the second best qualified man. In 1869, General Grant became president, and Schuyler Colfax of Indiana became the first president to be sworn in in the new Senate chamber. Colfax also became the only vice president accused of taking bribes, and he left the office under a cloud of scandal. By 1876, the Washington Monument, after considerable delay, was up to 153 feet, and the period of the mediocre presidents was upon us, and the vice presidents were in tune with the times. When Rutherford B. Hayes became president in the disputed election of 1876, his vice president was William A. Wheeler. When informed who his running mate would be, Hayes said, and who is William Wheeler? In 1880, 
The winning ticket was James A. Garfield and Chester Arthur, Republican. Once again, the United States was to have a president through assassination. Four months after his inauguration, President Garfield was shot by a frustrated office seeker as he entered a Washington Railroad station. Inventor Alexander Graham Bell was brought in to use his induction balance instrument to locate the bullet lodged in Garfield's spine. For two months, while Garfield lay fighting for his life, neither Vice President Chester Arthur nor the country knew whether the president's rights and duties devolved upon the vice president. In September, Garfield died, and Arthur spent the next three and a half years as president, vainly trying to get Congress to clear up the confusion about the vice presidency. President Cleveland's vice president in 1893 was a politician from Illinois named Adlai Stevenson. The Washington joke was, there goes the vice president with nothing on his mind but the state of the president's health. In 1901, William McKinley rode to the White House for his second term. And for the first time in 40 years, there was a vice president worthy of the office. In the words of William Allen White, they nominated Teddy Roosevelt not to praise him, but to bury him. Theodore Roosevelt, hero of the Battle of San Juan Hill, was too unpredictable a governor of New York for the party bosses to handle. So they kicked him upstairs and out of Albany by nominating him for the vice presidency. Roosevelt, who wanted to abolish the office, fought it, but suddenly changed his mind and became a dynamic campaigner. Six months later, an assassin's bullet again changed the nation's destiny. President McKinley was shot while visiting the Buffalo Exposition. And as Republican boss Mark Hanna said, that damned cowboy is in the White House. Roosevelt proved to be an outstanding president and was doubtless an improvement on his predecessor. Woodrow Wilson had the same vice president for two terms, Thomas R. Marshall, perhaps best remembered for what this country needs is a good five cent cigar. Later, Marshall's vice presidency ceased to be a laughing matter as the office became the center of the worst crisis since Tyler. Woodrow Wilson, a victim of a paralytic stroke, lay physically helpless for six months. The Constitution says that in the event of presidential disability, his powers and duties devolve on the vice president. But there was no machinery by which his illness could be certified. There was no presidential assistant to decide which matters of state should be submitted to the sick president. Pressure was brought on Vice President Marshall to step in. He refused, apprehensive that a recovered president would one day denounce him as a usurper. In 1920, both parties put up an Ohio newspaper man for the presidency. The Republicans chose Warren G. Harding, the Democrats, James M. Cox. Ironically, their vice presidential running mates, Calvin Coolidge and Franklin Roosevelt, selected as afterthoughts, were destined to loom much larger in history. The Republican delegates, revolting against Henry Cabot Lodge's dictation, nominated Governor Coolidge, also of Massachusetts, on the first ballot. When Coolidge went to Washington to preside over the Senate, he had never seen the Senate in action, had in fact never even been to Washington, nor even left New England. He became the first vice president to sit regularly with the cabinet. Two years later, Warren Harding passed into contemporary history with a name so clouded by the treacheries of his friends that none would do it honor. For the second time in five administrations, the American people had a president by lottery. Coolidge came down from Vermont for the Harding funeral and was elected two years later for a term of his own. For the country, it was the plateau of roaring prosperity and a quiescent bucolic leadership characterized by Silent Cal. Coolidge's second term vice president was Charles Helen Maria Dawes. He got off to a stormy start by lecturing the Senate on the evils of filibustering and then turned down all suggestions that he set with the Coolidge cabinet. Charles G. Dawes received one vote. In 1928, neither Coolidge nor Dawes chose to run and the convention took them at their word. Calvin Coolidge, four and one half votes. Joseph I. France, four votes. Herbert Hoover, 1126 
and one half vote. When Herbert Hoover was nominated as the Republican candidate for president in 1928, one of his most violent critics was the Senate wheel horse, Charles Curtis of Kansas. But after Hoover had won the nomination, Curtis was delighted to become his running mate. Will Rogers wrote, I knew the Republican Party owed Curtis something, but I didn't think they would be so low down as to pay him off this way. Between Charles Curtis and his successor, John Nance Garner, came a vice president not to be found in the history books. His name was Alexander Throttlebottom, and he was as much a part of the times as the Depression, apple stands, soup kitchens, and the low ebb to which the vice presidency had sunk. Satire can be the most biting form of truth, and of thee I sing was political satire at its best. It won the Pulitzer Prize for 1931. Produced by Sam Harris, book by George S. Kaufman and Maury Ruskin, music by George and Ira Gershwin, it is most richly remembered for President Wintergreen's forlorn little running mate, Alexander Throttlebottom, played by Victor Moore. It opened December 26, 1931, and Victor Moore recreates for us that scene from Act Two, Scene One, when Throttlebottom was a tourist at the White House. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the executive office. You will probably find this the most interesting room in your entire tour of the White House. It is in this room that President Wintergreen signs the many laws that govern your everyday life and from which he controls the various departmental activities. Here come various heads of government for daily consultation with the executive and to receive from him the benefit of his wide experience. It is in this room, ladies and... Uh, I, I, I beg your pardon, sir, but would you please stay over there? You see, we're personally responsible if anything is stolen. Oh, yes, sir. Well, I wouldn't feel like that. Oh, thank you. Now, are there any questions? Does the president reside here all the year round? All the year round, except when Congress is in session. Where does the vice president live? Uh, who? The vice president. Where does he live? Just a minute, please. Vice Regent, Vice Roy, Vice... Society? I'm afraid he's not in here. Uh, I could tell you about that. What? I know where the vice president lives. Where? On Z Street. 7214 Z Street. It's next to the last house on the right-hand side of Z, way down to the end of Z Street. Well, that's very interesting. He has a house there, has he? Uh, well, he lives there. All by himself? No, with the other boarders. That's a very nice place, too. It's Mrs. Spiegelbaum's. It's a lovely place if you like kosher cooking. Think of you knowing all that. Are you a Washingtonian? Well, I've been here since March 4th. I came down for the inauguration, but I lost my ticket. You don't say. Is this the first time you've been to the White House? Yeah, I didn't know people were allowed in here. You seem to know the vice president pretty well. What kind of a fellow is he? Oh, he's a nice enough fellow when you get to know him, but but nobody seems to want to know him. What's the matter with him? Oh, there's nothing the matter with him, just vice president. He don't talk much about it. I guess he's a little ashamed. You see, he's afraid that his mother will find out about it. Well, how did he come to be vice president? Well, they put a lot of names in a hat, and he lost. What does he do all the time? Well, he sits in the park and feeds peanuts to the pigeons and the squirrels. And then he takes walks and goes to the movies. And last week, he tried to join the library. But he needed to have two references, so he couldn't get in. But uh, when does he do all his work? What work? Well, doesn't he preside over the Senate? Well, sure he does. That's the vice president's job. What is? To preside over the Senate. Over the what? The Senate. You know what senators are, don't you? Yeah, I saw him play yesterday. Oh, no, no, no. I, I mean, the vice president presides over the Senate. It meets in the Capitol. Uh, when does it? Now. It's going on right now. Well, how do you get to this place? Streetcar at the door, right up Pennsylvania Avenue. I guess I'd better get up there right away. Why? Well, you see, my name is Alexander Fallabottom. And I'm the vice president. Oh. Bye. <laughs> <laughs>
Bye.